Well, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Katie. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace United Methodist Church. You may notice I'm dressed a little different today, as is our choir. Turns out we have to decide the date to turn on the heat months in advance, and who thought it would be 80 degrees at the end of October? So we are asking for a little bit of grace so we don't all melt up here. And hopefully next week when it cools down, we'll be back in our robes again. I know, I see it. Don's over here playing me a sad song. Thank you, thank you. We are so glad you've come to join us for worship this morning. Special welcome to everyone joining us online. I know we have several who are home with kids with runny noses or who have tested positive for COVID. So just know we are keeping you in our prayers during this season and hope that God's healing peace is with you. Feel free to comment on Facebook. Let us know you're here and share any prayer requests that you may have. This morning, I am delighted to let you know that our prelude is going to be the one and only beautiful Miss Ellen Sulcer sharing it. I know we all have a little applause already. So I'm going to invite us to prepare our hearts and minds as we come to God in worship. Amen. I cannot believe I forgot to mention this morning in the announcements a special thank you from my whole family for this past week for all of those who have kept us in your prayers and more importantly fed my children while I was out on medical leave. Thank you so much. I had spoken with Pastor Phil. He said you all behaved very well last week during worship. So I'll give you all the A plus for that, but thank you so much for keeping our family in your prayers during this time. So with that, I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able in body or spirit and let us call one another to worship. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, slow down. I know, I'm excited. It's a great first hymn, but we're going to do the call to worship, all right? She's ready. I love it. Come and come and worship you who woke early and you who slept late, you who come often and you who don't. Whether we are first or last or somewhere in between, there is room for all of us in God's kingdom and more than enough grace to go around. Let us worship God together. Our opening hymn is number 139. You'll find it in the big fat hymnal. Let us sing together.
may be seated as we continue our time of worship, moving into this time of prayer, sung and spoken. I know there are many concerns, many people on our hearts that we bring this morning into this place. And so I invite us, we're going to hear through it once, and then we're going to begin our prayer time together with these words from Obadiah as well. Let us go to God in prayer. Listen, Lord, as I pray. Pay attention when I groan. You are my King and my God. Answer my cry for help, because I pray to you. Each morning you listen to my prayer as I bring my request to you and wait for your reply. Let all who run to you for protection always sing joyful songs. Provide shelter for those who truly love and let them rejoice. Our Lord, you bless those who live right and you shield them with your kindness. Almighty God, you are righteous and just. You are the judge and the deliverer, and we worship you. Our world, Lord, needs your intervention with goodness and fairness. Come to us. Our lives, Lord, need your touch of healing and restoration. Come to us. Thank you for the message of Obadiah who reminds us that you see the ruins and you will intervene, that you know the loss and you will restore. Give us courage and strength to persevere with you no matter our circumstances until the day we see you face to face.
Holy God, we know that you are listening, but our hearts are heavy. For there are too many in our congregation who are dealing with illness, many who are struggling with grief. And so God, we cry out once again, asking that your spirit come into these places where there is hurt and loss, fear and worry. May your spirit of peace fall upon all those names that we carry in our hearts this morning. Fall upon our church and fall upon our community that we love. We ask God, even as we see the beauty of the trees changing colors, as we enjoy another day where it's still not quite cold yet. God, even in these small miracles, we give you thanks and we rest in that knowing that you are faithful, that fall will turn to winter and spring will come again, that you have been with your people generation after generation. And so whatever we carry this morning into this place, we know that this is a safe place where we can rest in your love. We can begin to address all of the difficulties that we hold in our hearts, that we can receive your grace again and again and again. Be with us now, Spirit, as we pray together the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever God's people said, Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning comes from our book of discipline. I'm going to invite you to join along by reading the words in bold. God in the Spirit revealed in Jesus Christ calls us by grace to be renewed in the image of our Creator that we may be one in divine love for the world. Today is the day God cares for the integrity of creation wills the healing and wholeness of all life, weeps at the plunder of earth's goodness. And so shall we. Today is the day God embraces all hues of humanity, delights in diversity and differences, favors solidarity, transforming strangers into friends. And so shall we. Today is the day God cries with the masses of starving people, despises growing disparity between rich and poor, demands justice for workers in the marketplace. And so shall we. Today is the day God deplores violence in our homes and streets, rebukes the world's warring madness, humbles the powerful and lifts up the lowly. And so shall we. Today is the day God calls for nations and peoples to live in peace, celebrates where justice and mercy embrace, exalts when the wolf grazes with the lamb. And so shall we. Today is the day God brings good news to the poor, proclaims release to the captives, gives sight to the blind, and sets the oppressed free. And so shall we. So in response, let us sing together out of the little black hymnal, as a fire is meant for burning.
I want to invite all the youngest among us up front, especially my three, because I know you're here and you have to come up. Elizabeth, Rebecca, Stephen, hi. Bad news, your mom's the pastor, got to come up. Giovanni, sir, great to see you. Come have a seat. Glad to see you, glad to see you. Come on up, guys, come on up. Hello? How about you walk around, have a seat, and then no one has a heart attack? Yeah. Are these three the only ones? You know what? A lot of our friends are out not feeling well this week. And you know what? That's okay, because when you feel sick, you should probably stay Just home. Elizabeth's children and me. Well, hopefully it's my children and you. If Elizabeth had children, we're going to have a whole different oh. problem we got to talk about. Sorry. Sorry. That's Sorry. all good. So we... You know what? We were gone last week. Why was I not in church last week, guys? I'm what happened? You were in um, you had a surgery? I had a little yeah. surgery, yes. And how wonderful was it that our church came to help out with stuff? So much. So much. I know. It's funny. Everyone brought dinner, and you didn't always eat the dinner, but the desserts were always gone. By the end of it, it, I think our church has some really good desserts. Yes, Elizabeth? They also made muffins. They also made muffins. Where Cindy's are with. Let me tell you, the muffins are a big hit. Yes. <laughs> so one of the things is when someone has to go to the hospital and they have surgery, guess what happens afterwards? They die. Well, hopefully not die. Yeah. <laughs> and there's healing. And then something comes in the mail that's not fun. Do you know what that is? A letter well, saying no. that they died. A bill. Yes, unfortunately, we live in a place where sometimes it costs a lot of money to get better. And for us, luckily, we are able to take care of that, but some people have a hard time. So, we are doing something in our church. Can you just read what that says? What does that say? Goodbye, debit. It says, goodbye, debt. And what's on there? I put a little something. A band-aid. Band we are going to do something from now until probably the end of the year. Pastor Pierre, to the end of the year, what we're going to do is we are going to collect money, and with that money, we are going to pay for other people's medical debt. Here's the cool thing. Every dollar we collect takes care of how much medical debt? $100? $100. So, Stephen, if you donate $5 to this, $500, $500 yes. I'll give you a hint. My surgery little more than $500. All right? So what I have here is I have envelopes for you guys, and you can put your names on it while you're collecting money. And because I'm, you're going to have to help me. I can't quite bend these days. Here we go. There's one for you. And inside, I put a little note in case your parents want to know more about it. Obviously, you three. Stephen, here's the deal. Because this means so much to me right now, I am willing to be your very first contributors. Wait, you're gonna give us money? <gasps> to put in the envelope so you can start collecting for this really, really good thing we're doing for missions. So everyone can put the first dollar in. Can we use the money for ourselves? <gasps> no, we can't use the money for ourselves because it's mission. This is part of what we do as the church is we help other people. Elizabeth, your arm is about to fall off. What's going on? Are we gonna give this to the poor? Yes. We are giving this to those who are poor and in debt from all their medical bills. Because you can't help getting sick, but the church can help you get better, right? And part of that is helping with all of the bills afterwards. So, don't get it. you don't get it, I'll explain later at lunchtime, okay? The other part is you can't read, so that's probably why that's as tough. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to be collecting some money, and then we will turn them in, and we're going to help out a lot of people just like the church helped me out. Isn't that great? That is. I will put like 120 bucks on this. Where did you get 120 bucks? Let's talk about that. I'm going to start charging you rent. <laughs> All right. How about let's pray together. Ready? Let's, you guys want to repeat after me? Sure. Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For all the people. For all the people. Who help us. Who help us. When we're sick. When we're sick. And thank you. And thank you. That the church. That the church. Is going to help. Lots of people as well. All right, on the count of three, we do our big amen. You ready? One, two, three. Amen. Now, Giovanni and Elizabeth may go back to the prayer corner to hang out. Rebecca, you're 
you and Miss Bree can go have fun. And church, let's sing our blessing over our kids during this time. Our scripture this morning comes from tiny little Obadiah. Chapter 1, because there's only one chapter in Obadiah. The Lord gave Obadiah a message about Edom, and this is what we heard. I, the Lord, have sent a messenger with orders for the nations to attack Edom. The Lord said to Edom, I will make you the weakest and most despised nation. You live in a mountain fortress because of your pride makes you feel safe from attack, but you are mistaken. I will still bring you down. Even if you fly higher than an eagle or nest among the stars, I, the Lord, have spoken. You were cruel to your relatives, the descendants of Jacob. Now you will be destroyed and disgraced forever. You stood there and watched as foreigners entered Jerusalem and took what they wanted. In fact, you were no better than those foreigners. Why did you celebrate when such a dreadful disaster struck your relatives? Why were you so pleased when everyone in Judah was suffering? They are my people, and you were cruel to them. You went through the town, sneering and stealing whatever was left. In their time of torment, you ambushed refugees and handed them over to their attackers. The day is coming when I, the Lord, will judge the nations and eat them. You will pay in full for what you have done. The Lord's people will escape and will go to Mount Zion and it will be holy. Jacob's descendants will capture the land of those who took their land and those the Lord have saved will live on Mount Zion and rule over Edom. Then the kingdom will belong to the Lord. For the word of God in scripture for the word of God among us and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to receive our offerings, I want to let you know the missions team has chosen two really wonderful focuses that are going to lead us into our Advent and Christmas season. You heard about the first one, that we're going to be part of this campaign to help eliminate medical debt, something I've become a lot more aware of in the past week. And with that as well, I want to say thank you to Janet Mum, um, because she is going to be donating the proceeds from her Year in the City sales that she has, love the pictures, to that campaign as well. The other thing we're going to be focusing on this Advent, of course, is we're going to be taking up a collection for UMCOR, which is the Methodist Relief Fund that we have. We know there's been a lot of flooding in the United States, especially here in University City a lot of support that needs to happen. And so not only will we be collecting funds for that, I know that we're sending a team to Kentucky very soon to help with some of the relief work and the damage that has been done there. So thank you, church. Thank you so much for recognizing that we can help. There's a lot in this world we can't fix, but we can help. And for that, I give you thanks. So with that, let us bring our gifts to God.
for the gift of the beautiful colors of fall, for the gift of this church family with us through all things, and for the gift of your son and all the blessings we receive. We thank you, God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we almost made it. My family almost made it. We were cautious. We were informed. We were prepared. Couldn't stop the inevitable. A few weeks ago at the dinner table, one of my children, who will remain anonymous for this sermon, declared that they wanted to sell the other children because they don't want to have siblings anymore. <laughs> to which the other two kids then started shouting that that's the child I should sell, the one making the accusations, right? And soon the dinner table descends into the tale as old as time. Families who have disagreements and siblings who don't like each other. I am happy to report that no child was in fact sold during this argument, especially since I pointed out that A, it would really mess up my end of year tax deductions, and B, I actually like all my kids. So instead, we were able to settle on the I never want to see your face again truce. From Cain and Abel in Genesis to my kids around the dinner table, every family has had the battle of the siblings, right? A few months ago, we did a whole sermon series on the struggle of Jacob's family. Jacob is one of our patriarchs of the faith, right? Created this foundation for our understanding of God's grace and God's belovedness, and in essence was really a jerk to his brother Esau. From the very womb of their mother Rebecca, these two brothers have been fighting, and it never really stopped down through the generations. The descendants would continue this struggle until we come to this tiny prophet, Obadiah. It's the smallest book in the Old Testament. Obadiah is a descendant of Esau, but he converts to the faith of Jacob. Obadiah lived and actually managed the estate for King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Those who grew up in the church, you starting to have any little red flags when you hear Jezebel? Two wicked rulers, we find their story in 1 Kings. Jezebel decides to hunt down and kill all those who would worship the Lord. It's Obadiah who hides the 100 prophets in the cave and cares for them with his own money. And it gives Obadiah this title, a very God-fearing man. And so his story intersects with the prophet Elijah, who confronts Jezebel in these schemes and gives him a bit of a place of honor among the rabbis. The rabbis say the book of Obadiah contains only one chapter, and it's entirely preoccupied with the fate of Edom, which are the descendants of Esau. Obadiah is specifically chosen to be the carrier of this message because he was an Edomite who had converted to Judaism. In fact, Obadiah is now chosen to be this bridge between the ancient feud between brothers, and he gives a warning what happens when we fail to break the cycle of feuds. Obadiah tells the listeners, he said, you were cruel to your relatives, the descendants of Jacob, and now you will be destroyed because you stood there and watched when the foreigners entered Jerusalem and they took what they wanted. Why would you celebrate when this dreadful disaster strikes your relatives? Why are you pleased when Judah is suffering? They're my people, and you were cruel to them. You went through their towns sneering and stealing whatever was left. You ambushed the refugees. As you have done, it shall return on your own head. The descendants of Esau were gloating. They were thrilled to see that Jacob's descendants were in misery. They're happy 
that the ruin has come upon this sibling rival, and God says through Obadiah, you don't rejoice when your family's in pain and struggling, because the same fate will come upon you. Just as you sit by and smile as your enemy is taken away, you'll suffer the same fate because you didn't show any mercy or love. It's a tale as old as time. And to be honest, it's one I'm kind of struggling with these days. Don't rejoice when your enemies suffer harm. Don't sneer with glee when tragedy strikes those whom you harbor anger against. I will tell you, I've grown past my childhood quarrels with my siblings. I no longer find delight when one of them receives their just punishment. And it'd be really easy to throw in some cheap joke right now about how the Lord wants the Cardinal baseball fans to love it when the Cubs win, but I'm not going to go there. Because the truth is, right now in our own family of faith, we're dealing with some major dysfunction and pain because our Methodist denomination is in trouble. Churches are breaking away. And some are preaching from their pulpits and from social media falsehoods about churches like ours that believe and practice God's welcoming love. My siblings of the faith who are slandering our Jesus-driven ministry. I'm struggling inside to love those who are making my blood boil with their deceit and cruelty. And it's just a taste of the larger division in our society. An upcoming political election and the attack ads are flooding media. Can we name how messy and hard this is right now? There was a time when I could be in relationship with those who voted differently than me. I, I strived to build a bridge, to see that even though we can disagree on the role of tax cuts, that maybe deep down there's still humanity and respect. But as language is becoming more filled with hate, as rights are being stripped away from the vulnerable, as truth is questioned and kindness forgotten, how do we move forward when the battle lines are so deep? When the words are so painful, where's the hope? Where is the way forward when truth is absent and humanity is denied? It seems like Obadiah is calling me to rise above it. I don't know if I can. Because I can't stand by and be silent while injustice occurs. And so this week, I got a little deeper into Obadiah's call. And I wonder if the challenge is really to look into the very nature of my own heart and how I respond and receive my enemy, when it's all said and done. I can't blame you for wanting revenge. I'll be honest, I've prayed a few times that God might pour out a little bit of God's judgment on my enemies, just a little bit of smoting, not a lot. All I can offer is a way forward, is the solution I fall back on again and again. Because when I don't know the answer and I don't know the way forward, I always turn to amazing grace. Because when I'm wounded and when I am struggling, I rest on God's grace. When I'm angry, when I want God to smote my enemies, I turn to grace. When I see others stand to the side and watch, when I boast and they refuse to help, maybe that's when I turn to the warning of Obadiah. As you have done, it shall be done to you, and your deeds shall return on your own head. 
as you have done, it will be done to you. We can feel really powerless in all of this, but we can choose grace. And in fact, I think, I know that we already have. And honest to goodness, church, it is the only anchor that has kept me grounded in all of this. That I get to be part of this church named for grace. And what have we done? We've packed thousands of meals to ship to Ukraine. We began a campaign to alleviate medical debt as it cripples our society. We showed up at Tower Grove Pride and we declared that God's love knows no boundaries. We have welcomed the university student and we have fed the hungry on Tuesday. We have marched and we have raised our voices for black lives, for immigrant lives, for queer lives. This is where we're putting our effort and our strength and our heart. These are the deeds that we can show and I know we're gonna do it again and again and again. And whatever comes this November at the election poll, no matter which churches break away from this denomination, when they're divisive, we're going to choose grace. When they boast and gloat and stand by the side as evil reigns, we're going to step in with mercy and love. Through many dangers and toils and snares, we've already come because grace has brought us safe this far, and grace will lead us home. Beloved, let's stand and sing to that hope together. I'm sure most of you haven't memorized, but for the rest of us, number 376 in your hymnal.
But I leave with you this prayer to give you hope. It is sometimes far too easy to look at the world's needs and our personal resources and feel completely overwhelmed. It is sometimes far too easy to tire of the work that needs to be done when we realize there is no end to the work that needs to be done. May we be encouraged in the face of our weariness and our sometimes overwhelmed perceptive. May we be reminded that miracles do still occur in this world and that they are sometimes planted in us. Let us open our ears that we may more fully hear the call to serve. May our hearts be filled with the energy we need to be the hands and feet of love in action. Let us enliven our spirits so that we might run this race, sharing the abundance of creation until all have found equality and justice in their lives. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.